Let's start in Exodus chapter 1, what God subtracted. You ever ask God, you come down to an altar, you just pray, Lord, give me. What, you, you want something. You want God to bless you. You want God to touch you. Have you ever prayed, God, take this out of me? If you've ever been to an altar and given your heart to Jesus, yes. <laughs> Lord, take, there's some things that, that don't belong. And we're going to look at that today through what happened with the children of Israel. In Acts chapter 1, verse 6, I'm just setting the stage. So there's a, quite a bit of scripture here in the beginning, so please hang with me. Don't fall asleep. All right. And Joseph died. Remember Joseph, he was the one God had uh, arranged all these miracles for him to be second in command in Egypt. They had this famine. He happens to be in a position to interpret the dream of Pharaoh and uh, all those events. You can look those up in Exodus. In chapter 1, verse 6, it says, And Joseph died, all his brothers... In all that generation, but the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose a king over Egypt who did not know Joseph, and he said to his people, Look, the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and it happen in the event of war that they join our enemies and fight against us and so go up out of the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens, and they built Pharaoh supply cities of Pithom and Ramses. Verse 12, But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were in dread of the children of Israel, so the Egyptians made the children of God serve with rigor. We'll just stop at that, at that point. They made them serve with rigor. Isn't it amazing when, when they uh, made them work harder, it says, and they increased and they multiplied even more. It seems like, I don't know about your life, but in my life when I'm facing a trial and a difficulty and I go to God, I go to God stronger than I guess I... I should be going as strong to him all the time, but when those things come, I pray more, I'm reading the word more, I'm, and I, I get, God helps me be stronger during those difficult times, during those times when, man, we had our little grandson, he was here at first service and nine months old in the hospital, and um, man, just, you just feel so helpless, all you can do is pray. Uh, a few years back, uh, Ashley, her, our other grand, our granddaughter Emery, just less than a month old, had that same RSV virus. It's been almost it's three plus years ago, in intensive care. And uh, I mean, all you can do is pray. I don't have the medical ability, and and they do all they can. But God had to touch them, and we get to those places that. We actually are, we come out stronger Amen. from going through those difficulties and trials. So 430 years after Joseph, Moses is sent. Moses comes on the scene, and it's time. God said, it's time. I'm going to send a deliverer. His name is Moses. So I think we're ex Exodus chapter 12, starting verse 30. You can follow along on the screen or you can look it up. This is after the plagues of Egypt. Now, you know the Ten Plagues. If you've ever watched uh, the Ten Commandments, you saw that, and uh, Charleston Heston and all those things. If you read it for real in Exodus, you can see the different plagues that come about. Chapter 12 is where the death angel has come through, and Pharaoh, they're just like, we're done with you guys. Get out of here. That's the Greg Ricks translation. Let me read it for you. So Pharaoh rose in the night, he and all his servants and the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not one house where there was one, uh, there was not a house where one was dead. Not dead. Then he called Moses and Aaron that night, by night, and said, Rise, 
Go out from among my people, both you and your children of Israel. Go and serve the Lord as you have said. Also take your flocks and herds as you have said and gone and bless me also. And the Egyptians urged the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. That means quickly if you don't know what haste means. For they said, we shall all be dead. So the people took the dough before it was leavened. Underscore that. Before it was leavened, they took the dough. Having their kneading bowls bound up in their clothes and on their shoulders. Now the children of Israel had done what Moses asked. They plundered the Egyptians. You can read that. They did not have time to make provision for their journey. They didn't know when Pharaoh was going to say, okay, I, you know, or think of, th you're a child of, of Israel. You're in Egypt, you're in bondage, and these plagues are happening, and the death angel comes, and you have the blood of the lamb on your doorpost. The death angel doesn't come. But there wasn't any uh, texting any uh, Instagram, anything like that to let everybody know, hey, we're going to pack up tomorrow, we're going to go. No, it was, hey, Pharaoh comes at night and says, Moses, get out of here. We're done with you. So they had to pack up and leave. They didn't have time for the yeast to work in the dough. Why? God didn't want them to pack up all those things from the old. He wanted something new. God didn't want them relying on what they could bring out, although they used the plunder and all these things. But for their daily bread, what did God do? He sent down manna from heaven. The Bible says when Jesus uh, was teaching uh, about prayer to his disciples, he said, pray this, give us this day our daily bread. God doesn't uh, run a Sam's where you go and buy toilet paper for months, where you go and buy all these big boxes. When, I had a, when my kids were at home, it was a better value to buy in bulk like that. God sent them out, and they had to rely on God daily. You and I as believers, we can't rely on what happened last week, last month. We have to have a daily walk with God. Now, I rely on the fact that at age five, I came down on an altar and asked Jesus to forgive me of my sins. At age 12, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. But I can't rely on just knowing that. I have to walk with him every day. I have to know him. I have to learn about him. How do I do that? By reading the word, by praying, by seeking him. So they didn't have time to get all these things God said, I want you, I don't want to subtract that out of your life because I'm going to do something new. Have you ever asked God to let you know in advance what's going on? <laughs> Has he ever called you and not told you the whole story? My cousin called me. He used to, he graduated from Southeastern. This is, when I do these stories, you got to remember, they're, they're so long ago, I can't remember the dates. But, but he called me up and said, hey, can you help me move? They were moving, they were leaving town. He had graduated, him, and he had gotten married. And I uh, said, sure, and I brought a couple of my boys over to help. We get there. The, my cousin lived on the third floor of an apartment complex with no elevator. That should have been a detail you told me ahead of time. No, I'm already, because I would have, I know why I didn't, because I would have had a, a very good excuse why not to go and help him. And Joshua was in that same apartment complex, he used to live Summer's Landing. and that yeah. Third floor, we, the couch was so wide it wouldn't fit down the steps, we had to lift it over the rails. I wanted to get a rope and just tie it and just let it over the side, you know. That was, my goodness, what a day. I've recovered since then. It's been 20 plus years ago. A little detail. When I was uh, pursuing my wife 
if you will, I'll put it that way. I, I wanted to date her. She didn't want to have anything to do with me. That's, now, I'm married to her now, so you know I eventually wore out. But My friend called me and said, hey, would you like to play racquetball with us? We need a fourth person. It was uh, my wife's best friend and her husband, and I was number four, right? So I'm like, I'm driving there. I'm like excited. Lori's going to be there. I'm going to play some racquetball. You do that three-wall thing, and it's the one on Edgewood. And I didn't know this, but they didn't tell her ahead of time. They were in the car driving there, and her best friend says, oh, by the way, we invited Greg to come. Important detail, thank God they left out. Because a little less than a year later, we're married. You got to wear them out. I'm not telling you to trick people. That's not what I'm saying. But sometimes all the details aren't there. I think our path with God, He doesn't always reveal everything that's going to be there because there's some giants maybe to face. There's some difficulties, some trials. And if we're starting out, we don't want to know all the tough stuff, if you will. When the children of Israel left Egypt... The Bible says God led them around in the wilderness because he didn't want them to face war right away. They weren't quite ready. That's a little bit of chapter 13, right around there. They, God knew what they could handle at that time. God knows what you and I can handle. The Bible says he won't put more on us than we're able to stand. But he's taken us somewhere. He has taken us to a promised land. He's taken us to a place we need to be. The children of Israel were not in Egypt because of punishment. They were not in that place where they ended up in captivity because God was mad at them, because God didn't like what was going on. He brought them there to care for them, provide for them, and for them to build up as a nation. They grew. It says even in the struggle, they multiplied and they grew and they became stronger. It's so much so that Pharaoh was scared of them. The people were scared of them because they were so numerous. How do you think the enemy feels about you and I as believers? He is he's scared to death. We think he might have the upper hand. He does not. We've been made more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. So they weren't there out of punishment, but of preservation. The nation of Israel went to Egypt to be saved from a famine, not punished. God performed miraculous things to get Joseph in position to help them. And he caused them to multiply and grow, and God sent a deliverer. When it got to the point it was time, he sent Moses, a deliverer. There's some of us in a place of difficulty and trial, not because God is punishing us, but because it is where he needs us to be for a season. It may be a season of learning, maybe a season of refreshing, maybe a season of protection. But if you're walking with God, he's not going to lead you where you don't need to be. If you're trusting in him and walking with him. Now, some of us, we don't always follow the direction that God desires us to go. We're not always on the path He wants us to be. The good thing is, wherever we are, wherever we find ourselves, He will help us and lead us out. Sin is our Egypt. We're not in sin because God punished us. We were born in sin because we're in a fallen world. But, just as he sent a deliverer to Israel, he sent Jesus Christ to deliver us. To set us free from the captivity of sin in our life. God provided them for them during the journey. Exodus 12, 31. Moses, so I won't read the whole thing again. But he, they did not have time to put the yeast in the dough to let it rise. If you're a baker, you know you put a little bit of yeast in that dough and you, uh, you put it in that uh, drawer. What are they, is it a proving drawer or something like that? Where 
I don't know. I'm not a baker. Don't eat any food I cook, by the way. If it's not from a restaurant or a microwave, don't eat it. But they, they have that yeast. It takes time, but that it grows and it works in that dough. When I make, I do make biscuits, I use self-rising flour. I found it's so much easier just to add a little milk, a little Crisco, or whatever, than it is to put in the baking soda and all the salt. And all. They just make it so easy now. Now you can just buy a bag of it and frozen, stick them in the oven and... Anybody? No? No, looking at me like... Am I making you hungry? You're younger. Maybe that's... They left in such a hurry. They didn't have time to make those preparations. They had just... Uh, back in the first part of chapter 12 and part of 11, Moses had instructed them about the Passover meal and they were to eat unleavened bread. They were to eat this bread. So... On their journey out, they were eating unleavened bread. Uh, they were eating bread without yeast. Uh, could, you can call it flat bread. I don't know. Uh, we, we served those styrofoam wafers for communion. You had them last week. I, well, I know they're not. They, they taste a little like styrofoam. The best way to take communion, with, I mean, if your mouth is dry, God help you, because it just sticks to the roof of your mouth. I'm just being honest. But we take that as a remembrance of what Christ did for us. And it reminds me of the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, coming out of the leaven of the sin that we're in. And God's made us brand new in Him. God didn't want them to prepare ahead of time. I mentioned it. He gives us our daily bread. What did God do to, them, to the children of Israel in the wilderness? He brought manna. He brought daily bread. Now, some of them tried to gather a bunch of it. He, Moses told them, listen, only get what you need for that day. But you know how some of us are. We go and buy the 500-pound bag of dog food, and we have a little chihuahua, right? And by the time the dog eats all of it, he's tired of it doesn't, uh, by the time he eats a quarter of it. We want, we, we want to gather all this stuff up, but with the children of Israel, whatever they ate that day, the next morning they got up, it was not fit to eat. And you can read your Bible to figure out because I don't want to gross anybody out today. He gave us our daily bread. With God, He doesn't just say, okay, here's Sunday, here's everything you need for this week. No, our Christian walk is a walk. It is a daily time with him. We have to nourish that Christian man on the inside of us. We have, to, we have to cultivate that relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's not just, let me stick that in my pocket. I'll pull it out if I need it. No, it's a relationship I have with him. Second Corinthians says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. God doesn't want us packing up all the stuff from our old life and taking it with us when we get out. He doesn't want to take it. He, he wants to subtract that from our life. When someone, if, if you battle with a certain addiction, let's say it's alcohol, the worst thing for you to do is just go to the bar and get a club soda or some other and watch everybody else drink. I mean, that's like, uh, of course, uh, I don't go to bars anyway. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good example, but if you deal with it, or a drug addict, you don't want to drive down the same streets you buy your drugs from. You don't want to go down those same paths that led you, that brought you to where you are in that bondage you're in. God set you free. Start a new path. The thing I talk to people about when they're coming out of those situations, you need to change who your friends are. Because if, if you did things with those friends and you get saved and you continue to hang around those friends, they're going to pull you right back. Make some new friends. Make some new friends in church. Make some new friends in Jesus. Amen? 
So why, I, I used to think about the children of Israel and when trouble would happen, what did they want to do? They wanted to go back to Egypt. They got hungry. Oh, we had all this stuff to eat in Egypt. They wanted meat. Oh, we had fish in Egypt. Well, those fish had bones. <laughs> they, wanted, they wanted to go back, but they didn't remember the struggle they had while they were there. Yeah, there might be food there, but there's also bondage. There's rigorous service. There's, you, you've got more bricks to make than you did before because I don't like you. In fact, if they went back, I don't think the Egyptians would have thought too kindly of it because they were chasing them. Pharaoh got his army together and was chasing them. And here they are saying, I want to go back. It's, it boggles our minds. If, you, if you're my age or a little older, you might remember the name Patty Hearst. And uh, she was a, supposedly, I don't even... Uh, uh, she was supposedly abducted and they tricked her into going and robbing this bank with this group and, uh, and they, they said she had Stockholm Syndrome which means that she took on uh, she identified with her captors and would do anything and people do that today when they're in abusive relationships or when they're in sin even they, they don't want out because it's the comfort of it, no matter how controlling it is, no matter how abusive it is, no matter how problematic it is, they run right back. The, the Israelites were the same way with going back to Egypt. Why would you want to go back and be a, a servant to build, you know, all these cities and I, if you've ever seen the pyramids, I taught world history, and uh, I never, I've never been over there, but I showed my kids pictures, and we had this archaeologist went up there, and those stones in the picture look pretty small, but they're quite large. And it took a great deal to build those, and that workforce was, were these folks, the Israelites and other slaves. God set them free. If you and I want free from the things of this world, we got to let God take some of that stuff out. We got to let God subtract those things that don't belong in our life. There was a young lady, and I'm trying to do the math in my head. It's been 20 plus years ago. My wife and I and our family, we pastored in the Daytona Beach area. We were two blocks from US-1. Now, if you know the area we were in, that's sort of the, there's a lot of high drug traffic area and all this, and God put us right there. We fed the homeless and ministered to folks. And this girl came, she was about 28 at the time, knocked on the church door. And uh, I talked to her and she said, I've run away from my pimp. I've left everything. I want to give my heart to Jesus. So you come to the right place. So I prayed with her and uh, she said, I want to, I want to get rid of, she was like, she wanted to get it out. She said, I want to talk to the police officer that's arrested me multiple times and I want to tell him where everything is. Everything I didn't want to tell him before, I want to tell him where the drug addict who supply or the uh, drug supplier is, where the drug houses are, and I want to tell you everything you need to know because I want to burn all my bridges so I can't run back to that life. That's great. So she talks to him for a good hour or so, and then he leaves, and I said, okay, where can I, you know, what can we do for you? She said, well, I can't go anywhere. I, I can't go out on the street or I'll fall right back into that mess. I can't, I called Teen Challenge, that's our, uh, the Assembly of God uh, group that helps people with addictions. I called them up, they had a home there in Daytona, they said, we can't take her. Not only are we full, but because she's from this area, it's just too risky for her to run away. 
So we got her a place for two days later down in Fort Lauderdale, and I said, okay, what, can I put you up in a hotel? Can we, what can we do? She said, oh, Lord, don't, no, I, I can't do that. Can I stay with you? Okay. So I said, why don't you stay here? Let me go talk to my wife. My wife was teaching school. And uh, she said, don't leave me here. I was just two blocks away. And uh, I'm afraid somebody either saw me here or I'll, I'll run back. I'll just sleep in the van. We had a church van. So I, all right. So, so I drive to my wife's school. Everybody, I hope you're with me now. So I go up. My, my wife teaches, I think, science and uh, social studies at this Christian school. Knock on her door and interrupt her class and said, uh, do you trust me? She said, yeah. I, tr I said, do you really trust me? What's going on? I said, well, I have a prostitute in the church van. Not the words your wife wants to hear. <laughs> I realized at that moment, I just, it came out wrong. <laughs> I should have said, there's a lady we want to help in the church van. No, I, my mouth is just the right size for my foot, and I put it in there quite often, let me just say. Uh, so after a good discussion, <laughs> she said, well, let, you know, when, we'll figure it out. So we ended up keeping her in our home for a few days, driving her down to South Florida, putting her there. But in less than two weeks, she ran out of that home. I'd love to say everything was great. No. I asked her during those few days we had her, I said, what draws you? She was detoxing while she was at our house. And she said, I've been through the detox. She said, but the memory of those highs just pull me right back. Even though the, the chemical in my system is gone. And uh, she, I asked her if she would make a public profession of faith at church. She came, we made her come to church and she wouldn't do it. And that was the... I, could, I can't, you can't make somebody, but... What I failed to mention, she had five kids. Four at that time were in foster care. The youngest, which was the same age as my son Jonathan over there at the time, I think just young, just a few months old, her mom was keeping. It, how, how could you leave? How could you let your lifestyle tear you away from all? It's just... We've got to let God subtract those things from our life. We have to walk with Him. If all we do is just say, Lord, come into my heart, and we don't walk it out, then we've just said some words. But He will, as I read in Corinthians, we're a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. But boy, if, if we run back to Egypt and we repack some of those things God's taken care of, we're just asking for trouble. We're just setting ourselves up for another failure. If you are in that place, God wants to leave it out. God wants to take... If, if, the Bible says if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. His name is Jesus, and we ask Him, and He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I think one of the tricks of the enemy is, say, you, you said that prayer at age five. I got saved at age five. If all I rely on is that one prayer at age five, I'm miserable 50 years later. Just told you my age. But I have to walk with Him daily. I have to surrender to Him daily. What God takes out of our life, what God subtracts sometimes 
makes us better. I'm going to ask Jonathan to play a scale on the piano. That is a scale. Now I want you to play notes one and four. All right. We're going to leave, I'm going to leave out, I'm going to, you're going to play one, four, and six, six. So we're basically playing three notes out of an eight note scale. So go ahead. Anybody recognize that song? Amazing Grace. Thank you, Jonathan. The scale was pretty, but when you take out five of those notes, it is a song. It is a beautiful song. It's a song almost everybody in America knows. If you've been to any funeral, you've heard. If you've been to any Bible-believing church, you've probably heard that song. But it's not the whole, all those notes that make it special. It's what's left out that makes it special. So what's, what makes you and I special in the eyes of God is not just who we are, but what he's taken out, where he's brought us from. If we were to list all those things that were in our life beforehand, that's our testimony of what God has done. How God has redeemed us and set us free. How he's taken those things out of our life and made us a song unto him. So don't pack up the old ways. Don't go back to your old habits. Keep that relationship with him sincere. 1 Corinthians 5, 6 says this. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. Anybody ever call you a lump? <laughs> it's the first time that's good, right? You're a, you're a new creation since you are truly unleavened. For indeed, Christ... Our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. The old generation in Israel, while they're going through the wilderness, rejected the promised land that God had for them. They turned their back on it, and that generation had to go so a new generation could come. The old man in you and I, has to, we, it has to die. Let that new man in Christ enter into the joy that God has for us. So what areas of your life do we need to say goodbye to? Do we need to allow God to subtract from us? And those things need to be out so we can receive all that God has for us. Is it sin? Distractions, discontent, hatred, resentment, regrets. What's in there? What's in there that God needs to subtract from our life? If it's sin, the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive us. But some of these others are also sin. When we allow resentment to grow in our heart. When we've had regrets, that can lead us to a place where we're not satisfied. God gives us that peace where we are today in Him. These things will, if you do these things, they will cause you to crave things that God doesn't want in your life. And you'll miss the blessing. The Bible says, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And he will add all these things.